Welcome again to the NPTEL course on storage systems. In the previous class, we took a look at fiber channel and uh, we looked at some of the issues regarding uh, fiber channel, especially bandwidth uh, aspects, okay, how much throughput it can give, etcetera. In today's class, we will continue but we will start looking at instead of the fiber channel interconnect, we will start looking at uh, ethernet kind of interconnect and then we will go into something called iSCSI another protocol which is layered over ethernet, SCSI protocol layered over ethernet. Now if you look at fiber channel, historically it has been very expensive because it is a you might call it a niche market for storage only and typically the port cost of fiber channel has been much much higher than ethernet almost a factor of about I think about 10. So invariably ethernet has vanquished other protocols. So all other protocols have usually become extinct where ethernet has been becoming stronger over a period of time because of the volumes and because of its simplicity of uh, the let us say the basic protocol. So generally people believe that from 1 gigabit ethernet to 10 gigabit ethernet is uh, when it happens it will become very low cost therefore everybody is uh, thinking that if there is a way to lower the cost of uh, storage you might have to move to something like 10 gigabit ethernet. Of course, 10 gigabit Ethernet is already quite strong in the core part of the network, the internet, but in a uh, in a departmental setting, it is still not that common. So, if and when this happens, uh, when the transition happens, then you might be able to easily encapsulate fiber channel frames in Ethernet packets. And this is what is called FCOE. The advantage of this particular model is that since lot of the enterprise storage is based on fiber channel, you basically the software does not have to change, all you have to do is to change the some of the switches and some of the let us adapters. Okay. So, so a lot of people believe that this might actually happen. So, you can see a lot of increasing usage, but uh, it is too early to say what is going to happen. Other option is if you really want to exploit what is generally believed that 10 gigabit Ethernet will actually become very predominant, then you can probably drop the storage protocol specifically crafted for storage the fiber channel protocol and move to some other protocol which can be also used to transport SCSI. One option is to go to TCP IP. Okay. So, one idea is to use TCP IP as the transport protocol. So, the iSCSI actually stands for internet SCSI that means that my device can be anywhere on the internet and it should speak the SCSI protocol. So, that is I have a SCSI device I should be able to access it on the internet. So, the idea here is you take the SCSI commands and encapsulate within a TCP connection. Okay. What is the advantage? You can use existing network infrastructure, there is only one network for storage and data and as I mentioned before, it can ride on the rapid growth of ethernet infrastructure. Okay. Nowadays, you hear of something called metro ethernet, that means ethernet that is available in a city. Okay. And uh, so, if you have metro ethernet in a city, you can negotiate with the providers for 300 megabit per second or 400 megabit per second etc. Those kind of bandwidths you can negotiate. and uh, all of all of this of course as I mentioned in the previous class goes on fiber. Okay. So, the basic idea is that uh, iSCSI could be lower cost per port compared to fiber channel. One advantage of going to internet is that it supports authentication protocols and specifically IPsec. Okay. Now, if you look about fiber channel, it was designed without security in mind because general assumption was that 
have a channel kind of devices will sit in a data center and that's got physical security whereas if you look at internet it has always been in the beginning it was designed for uh, let us say um, let us say regular use without thinking about security but later the security aspect has been added on to it and now you have something like ipsec even though there are problems with ipsec it is still a good protocol it is uh, may not be the best but it is a good good enough protocol and a lot of people are using it okay so the thing is if i go to iscsi one advantage i have is that i can just directly use the security mechanism that's available for ip and the good thing about going to ip is that it's a widely used protocol so whatever advantages you get because of the widespread adoption of ip all of it naturally comes to you to uh, uh, for your scsi also okay that's one thing which is very strong with respect to going to iscsi the only difficulty could be that internet being a uh, assemblage of widely different types of devices and interconnects you may not be able to guarantee certain uh, let's say uh, delays for example you might have different types of delays which is a big problem if there is some way to handle this problem iscsi could be a real good contender okay the basic issue is that internet is highly heterogeneous so how do we ensure that uh, we have reasonable uh, guarantees with respect to delays diagrammatically you can look at iscsi as follows you will have a physical interconnect between two links at the link layer of course you have ip and then you have a tcp connection actually multiple tcp connections between at the tcp level on top of it is iscsi which is basically the protocol which essentially encapsulates scsi okay uh onto uh using tcp and uh, so essentially what we are talking about is scsi's application iscsi is some kind of presentation layer and tcp is the protocol so this is what's happening again there are varieties of iscsi possible we can have a purely software iscsi that means that your host does all the processing with respect to both tcp ip processing as well as iscsi in a sense this is completely done in software whereas the adapter is a regular ethernet card nic whatever what you might call vanilla adapter card you can directly use or you can attempt to move some parts of the functionality that is in software into hardware firstly because this part of it can be especially the tcp ip part of it is very expensive to be done in software so that is basic idea about what is called tcp offload engines the tcp offload engines basically take care of the tcp processing in hardware and then the software only has to handle scsi and iscsi part so these one other types of adapters and of course the final thing would be that the host only speaks scsi protocol and all the adapter which is connected to the cpu okay it speaks scsi protocol directly but using iscsi as the medium as the uh, way to uh, send commands and receive commands so this also is possible so there is a lot of possible configurations this being lowest cost in terms of uh, uh, lowest and slow this could be probably the more expensive one and probably much faster so again just to reiterate iscsi what we do is we map the scsi block oriented flow rate over tcp ip now notice that tcp ip is uh it doesn't have any um it's what is called a stream protocol and you have to essentially now layer on top of it a uh, something which has got a structured way of um structured way of uh, sending the data okay so so there is some small conflict between the tcp ip model 
and what uh, SCSI is doing. Okay. Of course, you will see this problem in lot of places. If you look at uh, SSL, there also you will see that it is what is called uh, uh, it has got some structures that has to be sent. So, it is not really a string uh, protocol that we are going to use. So, here what we do is in iSCSI, we create a session between the SCSI initiator and the target, SCSI target. What is the session? It is a group of TCP connections linking an initiator with the target identity uh, target and this particular session is identified by a connection ID. Okay. So, basically it is a group of TCP connections linking an initiator with a target and this group is identified by connection ID. Now, because SCSI requires ordered command delivery, iSCSI has been specifically designed with some sequence numbers so that you can support ordered command delivery okay, within a session. Now, since iSCSI uses TCP IP, the throughput of iSCSI is going to be determined by what TCP can provide. And typically, there is something called TCP congestion control algorithm that we will discuss soon. That basically governs how much throughput we get in iSCSI. If you look at uh, fiber channel, we had various classes, and the class that is widely used is the one which has got buffer to buffer flow control. It does not have, even though there is a class 1 which has got end to end flow control. The one which is used in fiber channel mostly is the class 3 which is got only buffer to buffer. Basically because if you want to do end to end to control in, in fiber channel, you require the switches and all the fabric of fiber channel to incorporate aspects like what TCP is doing, congestion, congestion control, whatever, okay, some mechanisms so that there is a way to get as much throughput as possible through the fabric and so there has to be some fairly complicated or uh, substantial infrastructure that has to be there in fabric so that you get a throughput that is possible in the fabric. Now, in fiber channel as far as I know this particular exercise has not been done seriously. So, all we have is basically buffer to buffer flow control and because of this the kinds of uh, throughput that you can get TCP in with TCP are still not possible with F fiber channel. Okay. That is the basic issue. Basically, TCP has got end to end flow control from the beginning, whereas fiber channel, in spite of its design of class 1, it is generally now using only class 3, which is basically buffer to buffer uh, flow control. And so it does does not have an idea about the end to end aspect even today okay, in spite of its uh, class 1 okay, uh, in practice. Therefore, uh, iSCSI throughput can be better than possibly fiber channel okay, especially on wide area networks. Okay. There are other parameters in iSCSI for example, max burst length that also determines how much of data can be sent out in one burst. Okay. There are other controls in the system. We just briefly look at the iSCSI, uh, how it works. Again, you can see that it is basically encapsulating the SCSI commands in TCP. So, you basically standardize how it is encapsulated with various fields, etc. Okay. For example, the SCSI write command is going to be, there is going to be a, uh, um, a structure that is going to take each of the fields of the SCSI write command and then actually specify the standard specifies how it has to be. Uh, encoded. So, you will write the SCSI write command, you send it from the initiator to the target. Again, just as usual in SCSI, the target has to allocate the buffers and be ready for getting the information from the iSCSI uh, initiator. So, it has to send a ready to transfer. Okay. Again, this ready to transfer SCSI command has to be encapsulated into a particular TCP uh, uh, on TCP, so with a particular structure. Okay and that is basically the RTP. Again the same issue with respect to when the initiator sends the data, this has also has to be encapsulated in a protocol data unit, this is basically iSCSI data out PDU and then this response also comes back. Okay. As I mentioned earlier, 
you also need to do other control management aspects. For example, you have to establish an ISCSI session, which essentially means you have to create one or more TCP sessions. Okay. And uh, you might also, if you are using IPsec, you might also have to use a security negotiation. Again, IPsec has a particular phase in which you neg negotiate what kind of protocols are using for security. Uh, for example, Diffie Hellman or whatever. Okay. There are various methods. There are actually six or I think six methods for uh, types of security, uh, uh, let us say, uh, mechanisms present. And also some of the parameter negotiation. Like I mentioned before, you may want to negotiate what is the max burst length. Okay. So all those things happen um, um, as part of ISCSI. Okay. So now let's look. Uh, we had a look at um, um, have a channel have it does flow control. Basically, it's credit based. We will look at ISCSI flow control. First of all, as I mentioned earlier, ISCSI is laid on top of TCP, therefore, it depends on TCP. Now, TCP uses sliding window for flow control, but also uses what is called congestion avoidance algorithm. The issue with TCP is that TCP assumes that the end devices are intelligent, but the network is dumb. Because the network is dumb, it is understood that it does not have any mechanisms to help you realize the throughput that it is possible. That means, it has to use some way of probing the system to figure out how much bandwidth is there and therefore, it, is, it has to use some slightly sophisticated control theoretic model and that control theoretic model we will discuss soon and it is typically called as a congestion avoidance algorithm. Now, on high speed networks, the typical uh, TCP that we use, TCP Reno. For example, Linux supports TCP Reno and also something called Cubic right now. It had used, it had supported other models also before, but right now the most common one is TCP Reno. It turns out that TCP Reno underutilizes network bandwidth. I will again explain what this means. I will show exactly some, I will give some further details. So, because it, uh, if you are using ISCSI and you want to get as much bandwidth as possible, because typically storage is requires high bandwidth. If you are doing backup, any of those kind of things, it is going to require huge amounts of bandwidth. So, the idea in your especially is it is especially important for us to use the network bandwidth well. Okay. So, since TCP you know, under, under utilizes network bandwidth, we need to have different models of TCP. So, there are various other types of models that have been proposed. We will look at few of them in some uh, briefly. For example, there is something called scalable TCP, HTCP, BIC, qubit TCP, etc. As I mentioned, qubit TCP is the one that is currently there in Linux kernel, recent versions. Sometime back, there used to be something called BIC, which is no longer available in the, in the standard Linux kernels. Available. Now, another issue about ISCSI is that you can, as I mentioned, you can have one or more TCP connections. With more one or more TCP connections, it is possible to increase throughput, but there are some problems. Okay. If you have concurrent connections, they can compete for bandwidth resulting in unfair sharing and TCP by definition does not have any such models of how to make sure there is fairness in it. And also there are some problematic aspects of TCP, the what are called synchronization aspects. For example, if there is a loss, if there is a packet has been sent between two nodes and there is a loss, then the, the kernel implementation of the TCP is common to all the flows. So, because of a loss on one, it will decrease the, the amount of stuff each flow actually is going to send out. Because each flow is now set, decreasing it, then the cumulative amount of stuff that is being sent also decreases across all the flows. So, suddenly you can see a dramatic drop in all the flows. So, in a sense it gets synchronized, all the losses get synchronized across all the flows and therefore, it can be somewhat problematic. Basically, I, the congestion information needs to be shared among all the concurrent con connections and need to come up with some newer models like some people have called it fair TCP. Okay. Again, I will go into some of the details in some detail. I am just giving you the high level ideas what exactly are the kinds of problems when you take something like TCP which was not designed for storage purposes used in the storage context. Okay, this gives you a diagrammatic way of understanding what could be going on. 
it turns out as I mentioned earlier the end devices are intelligent the network is considered to be not so intelligent. That means that if you do not have any uh, let us say take care of uh, what the kind of situation that could be developed you might get into what is called uncontrollable congestion for example the red line like, like this. Why is this happening? The reason why this is happening is because TCP nobody tells TCP how much bandwidth is there because I can suddenly connect my laptop here and expect to talk to some other party somewhere else right and no, no information is given to the laptop saying this amount of bandwidth is available. That means this particular laptop has to probe the network find out how much bandwidth is there and it has to do it in real time okay. Now this is somewhat different from if you are talking about fiber channel etc. In fiber channel it is a more structured environment and you essentially tell each of those fiber channel entities some number of, you give it some number of credits and so in a sense it is a slightly more structured environment here it is basically totally unstructured. So what does the TCP IP do? It starts pumping packets to see how much packets how many packets can be sent before some kind of loss occurs to the flow. So if suppose this 100 percent is the maximum capacity in the system for that particular connection between my laptop and something else. I will keep on increasing my some number of packets are sent up to this point and then suddenly I just experience a loss. Now if once I experience loss then I have to back off I cannot be sending at the same rate because I notice that I cannot be doing it. There are various models the first simple TCP model was to come back to ground 0 and start again again go down to 0 and come back again. Now basically we can see that with this kind of model you can essentially get if you integrate the area under this red curve that is essentially the amount of bandwidth you have okay you average it essentially you are getting some closer to possibly half or close to that amount of bandwidth available. Okay. Now if you do some congestion avoidance probably you are going to be in this blue category okay you increase slightly more gradually you do not overshoot as much as this guy possibly did but you do it slightly gently and then you suffer some losses you slightly contain it you do not go all the way to almost ground 0 it goes slightly lower and somehow try to figure out a way of doing it slightly better. This is an example of managed condition for internet. Ideally what I want for storage is something like this I want to discover the, the let us say the capacity and hopefully stay constant like this if I can do it then it is the best for me. This typically this is what I would prefer because this is what we normally do in a data center kind of situation. We can essentially get this kind of throughputs, consistent performance, and because for, for storage backup is an important aspect. So for those kind of things, it's really important to be able to say how long it's going to take because they take a long time in the first place. So I need to have some kind of a, a idea about how long it takes. Okay. So. Ideally I would like to be in this category even though it is not 100 percent but I want to be consistent performance is what I am looking for okay. So the idea is how does uh, ISCC or any other model that writes on top of TCP how can we make this happen okay. that means we have to understand the TCP models. Okay. Again just to summarize some of the things what we talked about TCP is basically a peer to peer protocol it has got intelligent end devices and dumb network. You have to estimate band bandwidth available, and unlike fiber channel or a telephone network, there is no setup before transmission. Therefore, it has a control theoretic model, and basically the acknowledgments that you get essentially clog the protocol. That essentially tells you how to go forward. So the standard method is in TCP is to you start from ground zero, you increase exponentially. That is what you do is you send one packet, see if it comes back it comes back then you increase the you know that there is capacity for two packets because one came back and you sent one and came back in one round trip. So there are two packets already in, were in flight. So now you can increase it to you send two packets and see if both the two packets come back the acts come back for it. So it becomes four then you again increase it by factor of two. So you keep on increasing it that is basically exponential increase till you hit a threshold. After a threshold 
you and this is determined by uh, some other uh, parts of the system you basically increase it additively because if you just go exponentially you are going to definitely hit a loss uh, very quickly and you may want you may uh, it can essentially uh, what it can do is it can the network can get overloaded too fast. So, the idea of this for is not to go all the way till the packet loss happens the idea is to increase it in a more gradual manner till you actually hit the loss. So, without uh, overloading the network. Now, once you hit the loss the idea is to cut back you sort of back off from the network and that is where what is called multiplicated decrease happens ok. One important thing about TCP is that the losses indicate lack of capacity network it is a very critical function it is not some optional thing without losses you cannot figure out how much bandwidth is there. So, it is part of the network protocol okay. it is not something uh, that can be dispensed with whereas, if you look at fiber channel etcetera losses are a serious problem it is not expected that you lose things ok. So, because there is no serious attempt at proving the network in the case of fiber channel it is mostly set up it is set up beforehand ok. Whereas, here you have to prove the network you have to suffer losses then you figure out what is going on ok. So, there is a big difference in the way perspective in the first place ok. So, for each connection TCP also maintains a congestion window which limits the total number of unacknowledged packets that may be in transit end to end ok. So, this is what is called the congestion window ok. So, if you want to really do good in TCP you have to keep the if you are doing on a wide area network you have to be sending packets. So, that the the various routers etcetera they buffer your packets. So, essentially that pipeline between the various routers they are kept full. The one way to do it is have multiple concurrent sessions and sending large data units that means you need to have large TCP window size okay. Again because it is the flow control that window size essentially tells you how much you can send out. So, the TCP throughput is proportional to MSS by RTT into square root of P where P's are the random packet loss probability and MSS is the maximum segment size ok. So, the way to increase throughput is to increase MSS or decrease your probability of losing packets or make sure RTT is small ok. This is the only way to increase throughput ok. Now, in the case of uh, fiber channel the throughput is given by number of credits of course, in fiber channel you can increase credits, but somebody has to do end to end control which is not uh, currently there in most fiber channel usage right now. Okay. So, of course, fiber channel also has RTT as an issue. So, that also is inversely proportional to RTT ok. The one major difference between fiber channel and TCP is that your TCP performance depends on the loss whereas, fiber channel as far as possible does not want any does not want to see any loss it is basically a storage protocol yeah, because uh, it is a it is designed for a different reason ok. So, again how do you achieve high TC performance large window sizes you can also use what is called jumbo frames. So, the TCP segment size can be matched closer to the ethernet uh, jumbo size frame frame size which is about 9000 bytes ok. Typical ethernet is 1500 bytes whereas, jumbo frames are 9000 bytes. You can use also what is called selective acknowledgements normally TCP uses something called cumulative acknowledgement here in selective acknowledgements you can uh, uh, send a bitmap which tells you which of them actually succeeded in going which of them did not succeed you do not have to retransmit those portions uh, that could be done in with the cumulative acknowledgements ok. So, this is useful in when the medium is dropping many packets and this is sensible because uh, if ISCC is going to do it across the van this may be appropriate. Again as I mentioned before you need to do traffic, traffic shaping or limiting we already discussed this part and the most important thing is you have to avoid packet drops if possible ok. Why is that the case because it turns out if you avoid uh, if you are going to have packet drops then the TCP retransmit mechanism actually takes a long time 
ok. I will come to this soon basically because you are going to be in the additive phase in the TCP protocol. So, the ramp up is going to be quite slow and because it is going to be slow you are going to have serious problems with respect to achieving the full bandwidth ok. So, to uh, let us just quickly look at um, some aspects of how this TCP performs ok. So, this is the what is called the exponent uh, the rapid increase the exponential what is exponential phase then you suffer a loss it comes down then you have a linear increase again you suffer a loss you come down. So, basically this is the threshold what I was talking about. So, the there are multiple types of uh, TCP. So, in the beginning uh, this one basically ramps up all the way to the beginning uh, sorry to the maximum capa to the capacity till it hits the loss then it cuts down to half the capacity and again slowly ramps up. So, this is going to be a sort of pattern like this ok. Now, this is a round trip basically you can see start from here um, sorry I made a mistake ok. So, basically um, the throughput of this is determined by three parameters one is called the congestion window that is the number of packets that are out in the flight the receiver window how much the recipient party can accept the sender window basically how much it has buffered from the application ok. Normally, we can assume that receiver and sender windows are fairly large. So, the only thing that limits your performance is congestion window ok. Now, as we note as we saw just now this change in the congestion window it is uh, like this right essentially means that you are not able to hit the capacity ok. So, you are essentially not going to see the full capacity ok. Now, you can people have uh, used this kind of uh, this sawtooth kind of patterns and if you integrate over this area you will essentially get the amount of bandwidth that is available in the system and that is how you get that 1 by root p and uh, 1 by rtt uh, factors in the bandwidth I showed you before ok. So, so let us just look briefly at uh, the various models that uh, TCP has got ok. TCP Reno basically what it does is if it was as I mentioned it uses additive increase for example, here this is the additive increase part and this is a multiplicative decrease ok. So, you are at you are going slowly one by one like this and then once the loss is there it drop dramatically ok. So, this is basically new congestion window is basically old congestion window plus alpha times old congestion window. basically if you what it means is that this is the uh, proportional increase. So, if you multiply by old congestion window it is basically the you are increasing it by alpha the packet the new num number of new packets that you can additional packets you can see given by alpha ok. The loss is going to be given by as a proportion of the old condition window by factor beta. So, that in Reno basically what happens is that if you you are in the additive phase if you get an act back you can send one more extra packet ok. That is your suppose you are sending 100 packets you can send the next time around 101, pa 101 packets ok. So, our basic problem is that this ramp up phase can be very very slow because you can see right you are sending one extra packet every round trip ok. So, it will take c by 2 c by 2 round trips before I can go from here to here ok. Now, if my uh, if I am able to send out 1000 packets let us say my capacity is 1000 packets that means, I have to wait 500 round trips before I can get back to this ok which is very slow ok. For example, you have 1 gigabit per second link ok. Nowadays, these are available in the wide area networks 1 gigabit per second is definitely possible. You have 1500 bytes packet size 100, micro, 100 millisecond RTT then Reno will take full 14 minutes to achieve full utilization falling loss event. That means, that in the previous example suppose I am here sorry I am here I suffer a loss event I come down here it will take me 14 minutes to get to this it is excruci excruciatingly slow ok. So, this additive increase is a bit too it is a bit too slow ok. So, people want wanted to see if it is possible to do something better ok. So, there is scalable TCP basically does that instead of in the previous one you had 
we had increased proportionality with respect to uh, uh, congestion window here we inst directly increase it by alpha okay and it is 0 0.01 okay loss is exactly same as before okay this is slightly faster way of ramping up in the additive phase. The other models also I am not going to go too much into it there are things like for example uh, you can both play around with uh, the alpha and beta you made it, uh, make it adaptive. So for example I will just briefly indicate what this does uh, HTCP does uh, there is as I mentioned it is adaptive. So uh, there are two uh, modes low speed mode and high speed mode. So the alpha is some value in low speed mode in high speed mode it is uh, slightly uh, uh, bigger and it is decided upon depending on the time elapsed since the last condition event and this alpha h delta is basically some function of uh, delta and delta l ok. Some people have tried using this also. Hmm. Now the there was another thing that uh, was attempted BIC and this was actually present in uh, Linus kernel for quite some time 2.6.8 to 2.6.18 this is called the binary increase condition. Basically as you can see the idea here is to see if there is a way instead of going gradually from here to here to see if you can go from here go to some in between position etc. Okay. See if you can do binary search ok. The idea simple, simple idea is to do binary search. Why go linearly one by one do some kind of binary search ok. You suddenly jump to see jump here see if it is ok. If it is not ok keep uh, increasing it by some suitable factor ok. So it consists of two parts binary search increase and additive increase. So given the minimum and maximum window sizes set the target window to midway between the two just like in binary search you want to look at in between first same thing ok you target window to midway between the two. You find that there are no losses at this point then current window becomes the new minimum and the new target becomes calculated ok. So what is the lower value becomes the the current window becomes the lower the minimum and again a new target in between value is calculated. If there is a loss then the current window becomes the max and then you reduce the window size the you reduce the window size and that becomes the minimum ok. Essentially what is happening is that you you are aggressive initially but it gets less aggressive as the window size approaches the target okay. Now it turns out that this also can get into some problems basically because uh, if the difference between current window and target width is very large then directly increasing it might stress the network. So to avoid this kind of stressing you can define some thresholds. So basically you come up with the difference if it is bigger than that threshold you actually increase it only by the threshold till finally you come to the, the difference is less than the threshold. Okay. So various uh, people have tinkered with this kind of algorithms and various uh, improvements have been made. Currently actually Linux kernel uses a modification of BIC it is called TCP cubic where the window size is a cubic function of last time since last loss event. Okay. So this has been experimentally shown that it works well in wide networks with large bandwidth delay product and uh, essentially it is a less aggressive and more systematic derivative of BIC. I think the details one, one should look at the papers. So this has been there in Linux kernel and is currently there okay. standard it comes in Linux kernel. Now given that we have talked a bit about TCP the question is for iSCSI what do we do ok. Now there are various possibilities I mentioned last time that one important thing about a storage protocol is that it should be zero copy. If it is not zero copy then you are going to suffer great um, difficulties especially from the CPU utilization point of view. Now for that reason there has been some standards called RDMA over TCP okay. and uh, which essentially guarantees zero copy and it has been standardized as a particular protocol internet wide area RDMA protocol. Okay. Now as I mentioned before TCP offload engines also attempt to do the same thing but unfortunately TCP offload engines were done by various vendors in a proprietary manner. So even if they have zero copy architecture their ability to interoperate has been somewhat poor therefore these standards like IWARP are better 
for achieving zero copy across various types of devices. Okay. So basically, what we what we have right now is, I want to have zero copy. So one I can do is I can use RDMA over TCP. But I am doing iSCSI over TCP. That means that I can't directly use use this RDMA over TCP. That means I need to find a way of extending iSCSI protocol that was layered over TCP. So it is actually layered over RDMA. Because for me, what the problem is that my original definition iSCSI was over TCP. Okay. But if I want to use zero copy, I need to have RDMA on top of TCP itself. So I need to essentially change iSCSI so that it is layered over top of RDMA, which in turn uses TCP. That also has been defined. This is called iSCSI extension for RDMA ISR, and basically this combination of iSCSI, RDMA, and TCP it eliminates TCP processing overhead from RDMA capable NICs. Okay. There has been another effort called SCSI over RDMA, that is SRP. Which uh, I'm not very sure, but I think it is not that very popular. Okay. So that also has been attempted. Okay. So it's basically uh, directly instead of going through iSCSI, this is the original protocol that came in the early 2000. It directly tries to layer SCSI over RDMA. So what we are talking right now is iSCSI over RDMA over TCP. Okay. This seems to be the one which is uh, used okay, currently. Now, there is another in, uh, interconnect called infinite band. Okay. Now, initially in the early 2000, this was proposed as a system to system interconnect. So, the basic idea is that when CPUs have to talk to each other, you have a multi uh, processor system and you need high speed interconnect, then infinite band was proposed as a system to system interconnect. And this also um, became uh, has been sorry it has become widely available and uh, it is widely used in high performance computing for uh, high speed because of its high speed. For example, it is very easy to get 40 GB per second kind of connections. It is not that difficult. So, I actually if you look at the infinite band roadmap, people talk about 120 gigabit per second, 200 gigabit and 300 gigabit per second. So, uh, high speed is certainly possible and so if you look at all the top uh, 500 machines worldwide, you will find that a good number probably more than I do not know close to half or so, I am not sure exactly the amount, they use infinite band as a system to system to connect. So, because of the wide availability of this interconnect, the idea would be why not use it for storage also. Okay. That is basically the uh, original plan. Somehow it did not take off that easily in the beginning, but now I think because of the widespread use of uh, infinite band in uh, high speed systems, I think it is going to likely to come back again. One thing about infinite band is that it has uh, some quality of, uh, quality of service models as part of its uh, specification. It also handles some uh, failover aspects and uh, so it is a slightly more complex um, specification compared to Ethernet okay. and uh, uh, it is not clear how much of all the specification for example failover or quality of service is widely available in all the products, but the specification is uh, has got quite a few substantial support for quality of service of user. Okay. So, if such a thing is available, the natural thing would be to use it for storage interconnect and then again here also we need to make sure that somehow you do not have uh, extra copies because extra copies going to kill your performance. So, there is a RDMA over infinite band also available. Okay. So, uh, this also has been defined and uh, I think many uh, at this speed like 40 gigabit per second etc without RDMA you cannot really survive. Okay. So, for CPU to CPU in uh, large scale transfers RDMA over infinite band is necessary and I think uh, as far as I know it is widely used. Okay. Now, one peculiar thing about infinite band is that compared to SCSI or uh, other the TCP IP etc 
many things have been left slightly underspecified. Okay. So, uh, for example, it has a notion of what is called verbs. Okay. That means these are certain types of functionalities that has to exi exist. For example, I should be able to send something, I should be able to receive something, but no, most of the parameters are not really spelt out. The reason why this is the case is because uh, uh, it uh, has to interact if it uh, if it, it is basically based on something called the via uh, specification and that tries to uh, ensure that uh, as little extra copies are made as possible and therefore, it turns out that uh, some of the things interact heavily with uh, other aspects of the uh, system especially operating systems or kernels and so they have left it sort of open okay. and uh, so it is slightly um, it is very well specified with respect to some areas like for example quality of service or failover etc but in terms of the api itself it seems to be under specified and uh, so this is one issue uh, with respect to infinity band but there are attempts at uh, there are various types of uh, uh, let us say standards that have come up in addition to the main standard so that uh, there is possibility of interoperability okay so um, given that it is highly used in uh, hpc area so that means that uh, in spite of this under specification it's still not a problem okay. so so let me summarize uh, uh, what we have done so far first of all we looked at some in the previous class we looked at uh, SCSI, sorry, we looked at SCSI and then we saw how fiber channel can be used as a way to transport SCSI protocol, uh, SCSI protocol. Now, fiber channel is very well suited for uh, as a storage is very well suited as a storage uh, protocol, uh, but storage is somewhat of a niche market. Because of that, the cost of fiber channel has been typically very high. And so, the trend towards is being to figure out how to reduce the cost of this uh, uh, fiber channel kind of base models interconnects. So, the idea would be to see if there is some way to move towards a slightly different kind of model and the model that is most uh, attractive is somehow go to gigabit ethernet or 10 gigabit ethernet. And uh, so, iSCSI is one model, there is a evolutionary path what I mentioned as FCOE fiber channel over ethernet which is an evolutionary path. Now, it turns out that this is uh, becoming available also except that it uh, it uh, also has certain complications ok. I have not really gone into it, but it turns out that if you want to use FCOE then uh, there are certain subtle, uh, subtle aspects of the protocol in fiber channel. For example, when a particular switch fails in fiber channel there is some way to recover from it ok. Now, that specific way in which you recover from it also has to be made appropriately available even if you use ethernet. That means that you are the same kind of semantics that was there in a pure fiber channel network also has to be made available on ethernet network. That means that there has to be some more extra infrastructure that takes care of those issues. So, even though it is an evolutionary path, it also in entails certain additional complexities and uh, so, but I think it is being attempted, it is being done. Of course, you are losing something also when you go through this particular path basically because you are not able to guarantee certain latencies uh, because the ethernet protocol has a different model. Okay. So, iSCSI is uh, becoming popular, but uh, as far as I can see 10 gigabit ethernet has not yet become widespread therefore, its use has not become that dramatic within a departmental setting okay. it still not happened. I think probably in about next 5 years or so if 10 gigabit ethernet becomes very uh, very common then iSCSI could be used as a protocol, but uh, it is still not the norm right now. Okay. Now, for all these things it turns out RDMA standards are very critical without RDMA standards there is no possibility of zero copy and uh, so this basically there has to be a lot of standardization around RDMA and a lot of effort is going here and it is taking a lot of time to stabilize this particular issue. Okay. And uh, if you look at InfiniBand, they are very strong in the HPC environments and because of this attractiveness about the kind of installed base of high speed 
uh, 40 gigabit per second or 20 gigabit per second kind of ports, uh, one can, uh, many have been attempting to use it for storage and I think it is also picking up. Okay. So currently it is a bit of com confusing situation. There is no one strong uh, interconnect that is available. The only thing that you can say is that uh, iSCSI on the top is everywhere and fiber at the bottom is everywhere. In between there is a lot of uh, churning going on. So we will not know exactly what is going to happen. But uh, it is very likely that uh, gigabit Ethernet actually will finally take over, but it is going to take some time. With this I am going to conclude this particular lecture.